Hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so happy that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is to go onto our Facebook page and like us there. And if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube, go ahead and do so now. That way you can keep up with these. With that said, let's get into our next message in our series, Life to the Full. Hey, it is great to see everyone today. Over the last few weeks, we have been talking and we've been in a series about living life to the full. And uh, we've been diving into a uh, fullest perspective and fullest engagement and fullest enjoyment. And I know for me, this has been such a great series to dive into over the last few weeks because I'm someone who likes to just pack a schedule, right? I like to be busy, and if we have a night that's off in our week, I like to put something in it. But I think what we've kind of tried to realize over this week is we, we just strive to live busy lives. But are they busy of good things, right? The question we should be asking is, are is our life, are we living life to the full with good things? See, are our lives full of things that would be God's perspective, right? And how he knows the full picture of our lives being ahead and before us and behind us. Are they full of engagement? See, we often have our lives so full of uh, scrolling through th things on a screen and watching the TV and living our lives through the lives of other people. Right? Are we engaging in the wrong things? Are they full of enjoyment? Are we taking every moment that we have and enjoying those things even in the hard seasons? Right? Are we feeling guilty for resting or relaxing? Are we actually enjoying what God has given us? See, we've talked about how the thief can come in and steal some of those things from us. He can, he can come in and take away some of those good things. The question we've been asking is, what is life to the full? This week, we're going to be wrapping up the series on life to the full with uh, fullest love. And I'm so excited to dive into that today. And because fullest love is actually kind of har hard to describe when you think about it, right? What is fullest love? Sometimes it's easiest to even think, okay, what, what is love not? Like, what, what is fullest love not? Um, and I think the best way to describe what fullest love is not is by diving into the story of my first love in high school. You see, I went to Zion Christian through elementary and middle school, and I know you're going to have a hard time picturing this, but I was tall and lanky back in middle school as well. Needless to say, I didn't have many girls that were chasing me down, right? That wasn't one of my problems in middle school. I didn't have many girls running after me. Then I went to high school at Zealand East, um, and most people from Zealand Christian go off to Holland Christian. So I was going into a new school. I didn't have many of my friends coming with from Zealand Christian, and I was one of the new kids, so I didn't know many people there. And a few weeks in, I had uh, one of my new friends come up to me and say, Matt, there's a girl that likes you. And I was like, what? Like, are, are you joking with me? This is, this is real life right now? Well, you just point me in her direction, right? <laughs> and later that day, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. It was great. <laughs> I, I thought I had found the love of my life. 
Uh, so I thought, right? To be honest, it was a new school. There were new people. I, I was meeting like hundreds of new people and trying to remember everyone's name. It was pretty difficult. And to be honest, I had a hard time for the first few weeks remembering my girlfriend's name. Now, some advice for you guys out there. It is fairly important to remember your girlfriend's name. Uh, it, it's one of the keys to a successful relationship. Uh, and you're not going to be surprised to know that that relationship, did, relationship didn't actually work out all that long. And yet, at the time, I thought I was experiencing full love, right? I was in a new love, and I thought this, this is the best that it can get. Right, so what is fullest love? Because some of us have experienced very full love, right? We've experienced a lot of love, but is it the fullest, right? How do you describe fullest love? And sometimes in order to realize full love, we need to experience what life is like not having full love, right? Not having love. Because enduring life without love is really hard, right? But it helps us understand what living a life with love is, what that fullest love can look like. See, the thief can come into our lives and tell us that we're not worthy of love, that we, we, are, we don't amount to enough, that people shouldn't be loving us, right? We may be, the thief may be telling us that, that the people that say they love us don't really mean that. They, they don't actually mean those things they say. There's no reason that they should love us. The thief tries to rob us of full love. But what is fullest love then? See, I think the story we're going to go into today, the story of Ruth, has a beautiful way of answering this question. But to understand the depth of a love story, you really have to know the details around it. Right? If you had a friend that didn't know about Beauty and the Beast and you were trying to describe it, you wouldn't start with saying, there's this beautiful woman who married this animal-like beast and he turned into a man. Oh, and then the candlestick and clock that was also living in the house turned to be people too. It's like, what? That, that, that doesn't make any sense. You don't know the details around it. And so we're going to be diving in today to, to a, some of the details around the life of Ruth and why those details make this love story so beautiful. So let's dive right in to Ruth 1. It says this, In the days when the judges... All right, we're going to stop there already a minute. Because I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I think it's important to know the context around the story we're jumping into. So it says, it says In the day when the judges... So we're very early in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. All right, so what we see is that in the day when the judges, the judges are before the kings. We spent all summer long looking at different stories about kings in the Bible. And so this this time is right before that. When the kings were were ruling, they would make the laws, and they would enforce some of the things that are happening in their kingdoms. But before the kings... There wasn't like an enforcer of that. So they had, and they kind of ruled by the book of Moses and the law of Moses. So these laws that were in this kind of law of Moses included things like the Ten Commandments. And there were other symbols and different rituals that they would follow um, because they didn't have the kings around yet. And that's how they would be living their faith. So Remember that as we're reading. So in the day when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the sons of his, names of his two sons were Mahalan and Kilian. And they were Ephraites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. So that's a little bit confusing because there's a bunch of names and a bunch of places. So we'll break that down just a minute. So we have a man named Elimelech, um, and he married Naomi. Okay, So she uh, she is married to Elimelech. Now they have two sons. Okay, The two sons are named Mahalan and Kilian. Then, uh, unfortunately, Elimelech dies. 
We see that Elimelech dies, so we're left with Naomi, Mahalan, and Kilian. So she has her two sons, which is fine. But, well, not fine. It's not great. But what we have in that culture, the, the sons would then take care of the mother, right? They would take her in, and all the wealth and the properties would be passed off to the sons. So they would continue living as that. Now, after, after uh, Elimelech dies, her sons, Mahalan and Kilian, marry Orpah and Ruth, not to be confused with Oprah, one, one little letter's off there. Orpah and Ruth. And a few years after that, about 10 years, the two sons die. Right? Which leaves us in the story with Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. And at the time, or- or Naomi tries to get the girls to go back to their, to their families. Right? So uh, Orpah and Ruth marry the, her two sons, but they die. So Naomi doesn't actually have a way to provide for these girls anymore. See, even if, if Naomi was able to marry right away and have two more kids, she pretty much makes the argument, it'd be ridiculous for you guys to wait for me to have two sons for them to grow up so you can marry them, right? That just doesn't make sense. It continues with this. It says this in Ruth. No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. Because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. See, remember when I said that the law of Moses ruled over the land in the time of the judges? See, it's because one of those, those laws was it's because the land wasn't very friendly to women back in that day. But what makes this even harder is that not only was it not very friendly to women, but it's even harder against widows. It's hard for a widow to live in this ancient time. See, one part of the law of Moses comes from Deuteronomy 24. It says this, When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, which is, if you can picture grain, it's the, it's the sheaf, which is the long part and then the grain on top. Um, when you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. See, God made one of these rules or laws to provide for the widows and the foreigners and the poor, right? He wanted people to know that he cares for them. Look after these people. Because in this culture, men were the ones who provided for their families, right? Men were the ones who owned land. Men were the ones who worked the field. So when the husband dies, the sons would take that responsibility on. They would care for their mother. They would take care of her. And we read that Naomi was left with her two sons, and they took care of her for a season. But then they die. You see, in ancient times, one of the big purposes in marriage was having children so that when, when the parents would grow old, they would have someone to take care of them. Right? We can see in today's age, we have retirement funds and pensions that when people get older, they can look to, to retire on and be taken care of when they grow old. See, in ancient times, that wouldn't be the case. The, the older generation would pass off all the land, would pass off all the wealth, and then their sons and their grandsons would take care of things, and their grandsons and sons would take care of that older generation. But for these women, after the sons die, There's no one to look after them. There's no men to protect them. There's no men to work the fields. No men to provide an income. And not even any sons or potential for those sons to take care of them when they get older. You see, these widows, even more than just being women in that culture, were in a very vulnerable spot. And this this is where we find the women right now. And there's so many things that are stacked up against Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. So let's continue reading where we left off. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, her sister-in-law is going back to her people, her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. 
when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So you can see, Naomi realizes the cir- circumstances they're under. Right? She knows she's not going to be able to provide for the girls, and she tries pushing them back to their own families. They have a better chance of surviving by going back to their own parents and having other men take care of them. Someone will take care of them there with their own families, but there's no promise of Naomi being able to provide for them with no men around. One of the daughters goes back to her home, but Ruth stays back, even though the outcome may not be all that favorable for her. Now, remember the Deuteronomy passage about the law around harvesting as we uh, continue reading about a new character in the story. It says this in chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So as we read that, you can see the word harvesters. And that's not in today's context. It's not like driving past a field and there's a big international harvester combine working the field. Like that, that's not what happened. Back in that day, they would have someone with like a hand sickle and they'd be slowly going through the fields, cutting the grain. See, they would be going through an entire field. Here's a picture of it. And you can see there's two people in the grain field and they're slowly cutting through that field with a hand sickle. And what they would do, they'd get a bundle and tie it up together and put it off to the side. Now, um, after the field was cut down and the bundles were removed, this is a picture of what it would look like for the widows, for the poor, for the foreigners to try and gather up the remainder of the grain that had fallen, right? Or that was left or dropped or missed. And as you can see, there's really not much to work with, right? These harvesters are not going to just accidentally drop a bunch so that the widows can find some, right? They are just trying to scrape by. This, This is a life that's not glamorous by any means. Yeah, they can probably come up with just enough food to live, But this is just getting by. And this is the life that Naomi and Ruth are walking into. Let's continue. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted his harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. What a happy group of people, right? So excited. Ah, the Lord bless you. Right? Boaz asked the overseers of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, let me please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and she has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. It's almost like they're saying she hasn't been working as hard as us. She did take a short break for a little bit. Verse 8, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water the jars the men have filled. See, do you remember what the law of Moses talked about, about leaving some pieces of grain for the widows? Right? Does does Boaz do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. He's letting people follow along behind the harvesters. But Boaz does so much more than that. Right? Boaz says, drink the water that the men have filled. And not only that, but I'll make sure you stay safe in my fields. I'm not going to let anyone hurt you here. I'll provide protection for you. Boaz is treating her so much higher than any of the any, any other men would in that culture right now. See, it In this next section that we're going to read, it gets long, but it really dives into the story and some of the details that are going to be really important for this. So let's continue reading at verse 10. It says, At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? 
Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland to come to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all that she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to an epoph. You try to say that. I have no idea. What it does mean is about 30 pounds. I don't know the word, but it means about 30 pounds of grain or that barley. So she carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth had brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, "Where, where did you glean today? Where, where did you work? Blessed be the man that took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work today is Boaz. See, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth, the Moabite, said, He even said to me, Stay with me while the workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Remember we talked earlier that in the field, Boaz provided protection, right? That There was a good chance that she could be harmed in a different field. Verse 23, so Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvest harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be provided for. Now Boaz, with those women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put, perf- put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he finishes eating and drinking. When he lays down, note the place where he is lying. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovering his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, startled Boaz, and he turned, and there was a young woman lying at his feet. (laughs) Kind of startling, right? Uh, What are you doing there? It's kind of the interaction that happens right after we read this. He says, who are you? It's a fairly appropriate reaction. And Ruth replies, that I, I, I'm Ruth. I, please spread your blanket over me since you are my guardian redeemer. This is, this is one more place that the law of Moses kind of comes into effect, right? Because what we see is this guardian redeemer language. We don't use that kind of language nowadays anymore. See, in the ancient world, the guardian redeemer was responsible for protecting a needy family or the people their family members who were in need. It was an influential relative um, who in the fam- the family could turn to in times of need. And in this case, that person for Ruth and Naomi is Boaz. So spreading the corner of your garment over me is kind of a re- weird request, right? That that's just doesn't make a lot of sense. But there's some imagery around that for what that actually means. It It's actually a request for marriage. So what is Ruth asking for? By Ruth asking for this guardian redeemer to spread that part of the garment over him, 
over her is Ruth is asking Boaz to take care of her. But not only that, to take it one step further, to fulfill the law of Moses and his responsibilities to protect her. And not only that, but marry her. And this is his response. Verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my, to- of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Kind of interesting, the noble character comes back. We just talked about what a woman of noble character is a few weeks ago. See, this story continues and ends in a way that we're all rooting for, right? Ruth and Boaz get married, and they drive off into the sunset together, right? It it, it ends happily. It's a happy ending. Love to the full. This this is a picture of full love. See, but what's fascinating is that this story of Ruth and Boaz doesn't just end with them riding off into the sunset. This last section in Ruth ends with a genealogy. And it seems like kind of a boring way to end a love story, doesn't it? Like when I picture the ending of a love story, you just see him riding off into the sunset, but you don't see it where it says, then they had kids, and their kids had these kids, and their kids had these kids. That's not a very nice way to end a story. But pay attention to the names of these, because Ruth conceives a child with Boaz and names him Obed. Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse becomes the father of David. Do you recognize that? See, Ruth, the widow who is so undeserving of love in that culture, she, th- there's no one really to provide for her anymore, is in the line of David. Right? Is in the line of all the kings that we learned about this summer. But do you understand what that means? Right? Ruth, the widow, the one who probably thought she w- sh- that she was unlovable, especially in that culture, is in the line of Jesus. Right? If she's in the line of David, that goes all the way through to the line of Jesus. Someone so, who might feel that she's so undeserving of love is in the line of Jesus, a widow, a foreigner. See, we don't deserve the love of Christ, but it is always there for us. See, I have found that undeserving love is so pure when it's undeserving, right? When you have that kind of love, it is the truest form of love. The kind of love where you receive it even though you don't deserve it. Boaz was a man of high standing and honor in his community. And he had a ton that was going on. He had a lot of requirements. And he yet, he makes time for Ruth. Ruth was a widow. She was lost. She was an outsider in a foreign land. She was not worth the generosity from the fields of Boaz. She was not worth the love that he had to give. And yet, Boaz loves her. Not because he can gain anything, but because he loves her. This is full love. That is fullest love. We experience love when we begin to understand how fully And completely, we are loved. And we can only get that personally from Jesus Christ. If you leave today with anything, leave with these three things. Number one, love is not transactional. Two, love is a choice that you make a million times over. right? And three, love is serving even when you're tired, even when you're exhausted. See, fullest love is not transactional. It's not. Right, for Ruth and Boaz, Boaz did not say, I will love you if you work my fields constantly and give me those, give me all the grain that you have. Boaz didn't say, I'll be your guardian redeemer if you work for me. Right? Jesus for us did not say, I will forgive your sins if you pray to me 18 times a day and read through the Bible once a year. Right? He he loves that relationship, but that's not transactional. That's not what love is. See, fullest love is a choice. It's something that you have to do every single day in every single Moaz, in every single moment. Boaz didn't have to choose to love Ruth. See, and God didn't have to choose to send his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. See, fullest love is also serving. Here's when you know uh, someone really loves you. It's when they put others above, when you put others above yourself. 
Boaz didn't have to serve Ruth by leaving extra grain out, by giving her water, but he loved her. Matthew 20 says this, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as ransom for many. My question for you is this, and I want to end today with this. I want you to actually answer this question in your head and share it with someone, someone later. Are you showing fullest love? To be honest, we have a huge need for people to serve in the church and serve in the community. Maybe for you, that means stepping out of your comfort zone and serving in our kids' ministry in ShakeOut. Maybe for you, that's stepping out of your comfort zone and leading a group or serving in a different area of the church. If you want to know what fullest love is, it's that unconditional love that we see from Jesus serving in his life. Do not allow the thief to tell you that you are not loved, that you're not worth it, because you so are. Don't just relax in that reassurance. Love the people around you so that they will have that assurance too. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and your story around Ruth and everything we learn about Boaz and how he loved her and how that so coordinates with how Jesus loves us and how sacrificial that is. I ask that in our weeks to come that we understand that love that Jesus has given us and are able to pour that into other people. In your name we pray. Amen. I want you guys to go out with this final blessing because I know as we've talked, some of these things may just come off sounding like they're super easy. Right, But when you get out into the world, loving people is still so hard. And sometimes it's even hard to love yourselves in those moments. But I want you to understand that Jesus is always there for us in those moments. And it's, it, it sounds cliche and simple, but it take that first step in serving and trying to show people that unconditional love for them by taking that first step. So I really encourage you guys to do that this week. But go with this final word. It says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or ever imagine according to his power that, it at, that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week. Hey, thanks again for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of our weekly rhythm here at The Foundry. We really hope that God spoke something powerful into your life today and we hope that you'll join us again next week.